Uh, I don't know everybody in the room. Obviously, I don't know everybody's background. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, though, none of us were raised Buddhist. Right? None, of, none of us were raised in a Buddhist household. Uh, most of us, if we were raised in any religious tradition, were probably raised in, a, in an Abrahamic religious tradition, Christian probably, just demographics, right, says that's probably the case. Um, so changing teams or moving from kind of one tradition to another, sometimes there can be some, some strains that happen in the process of that or some confusion that's associated with when when words or ideas or concepts are used in both traditions, but in a different way, right? When they don't mean exactly the same thing in, in different traditions. So an obvious example of that is the word faith, right? Uh, Christians use the word faith a lot. We just use it too, maybe not quite so much, but we both use the word and so using that word, if we don't mean the same thing by it, when we use the word, that could create some, some confusion, maybe even some conflict when people are talking to each other, you know, some interpersonal kinds of conflict. Um, so what I want to do this morning is a little kind of side-by-side -side comparison about the word faith. Um, and I want to focus in particular on the, the scriptures in each tradition that are the ones that are probably referred to the most as kind of the basis for the idea or the understanding of what the word faith means. Now, let's, let's start with the Christian side and then we'll come over to the Buddhist side. Obviously, Jesus never said the word faith and none of the biblical writers used the word faith because they didn't speak English, right? They were, they were using the word faith because they didn't speak English. Uh, Faith is a translation of a word, and since most of the, the New Testament of the Bible, the Christian scriptures were written in Greek, right? that was kind of the original language of the Christian scriptures. If you go back to the original scriptures, the Greek word that was used, that, we, that in most modern Bibles is translated as faith, is the word pistis. That means faith, or trust, or certainty. One interesting thing about it, though, is if you kind of look at the word and what's the root of the word, it actually comes from, it's related to the word peto, which means to persuade, right? So faith kind of implies this is something I've been persuaded of, right? I've been convinced of this to believe that this idea or this thing is, is true, something I have trust in or something I have certainty about that comes from persuasion from the outside. Now, that word pistis, if you go back to the kind of the Greek scriptures, it's in there 36 times, 36 times in the Christian scriptures in the New Testament, the word pistis is used. Um, it's in all of the gospels except John, strangely. John, well, John's a weird gospel in lots of ways, but it never uses the word faith. That's kind of odd. Uh, 23 times, though, in the New Testament scriptures, the word pistis is used in the letters of Paul or the letters attributed to Paul, all those, all those little scriptures near the back that are letters that are the tradition records as Paul having written to these various communities. Um, so it's, I mentioned that specifically because the common understanding of the word faith that you see in mainstream Christianity primarily reflects the way Paul wrote about it. Right, the kind of the Pauline idea of what faith means. And it's from one of those letters attributed to Paul that the most common text in the Christian scriptures that's referred to to explain the idea of faith, it comes from one of those letters. Uh, the most commonly quoted Christian passage about, about faith comes from one of his letters. So it's from the letter to the Hebrews from the 11th chapter, the very beginning of the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Right? So the common understanding in our culture, given the degree to which sort of our culture is so very influenced by that Christian, especially Protestant kind of tradition, shows the influence of that idea that Paul had about what faith means. To take something, as we say, on faith, 
means to assume that the thing is true even in the absence of any evidence for it, right? Uh, in other words, to have blind faith, right? To have blind faith mean, in something means to uh, believe that it's true even if you can't see evidence that supports the idea that it's true. And in the rest of that 11th chapter in Hebrews, Paul mentions um, a number of characters going back to Old Testament stuff, the Jewish scriptures, where um, characters are rewarded by God for their faith, uh, believing things, be, having confidence in things, even things that common sense says couldn't possibly be true, such as an elderly barren woman who suddenly has a child way, way, way later than she should have been able to have a child, things like that. So he stresses that the reason faith matters is because having faith is pleasing to God. Right? And that's the most important thing, is to live your life in a way that's pleasing to God. So keeping all of that in mind, how does the Buddhist understanding of faith compare? How is it similar? How is it different? Let's start with words again. Right? What are the words that we use? So if you go back to the original languages of the scriptures, we've got uh, shraddha in Sanskrit, uh, sadha in Pali, uh, when things get translated into Korean, they use the word shin. So shin means faith. Faith, confidence, belief. Uh, it includes a, a mental conviction that the path the Buddha taught is effective. Right? So coming along with, there's kind of two things that go with that. On the one hand, there's a, there's a commitment to follow that path. If we think it's effective, then we should follow it. But the other thing that comes from that is an affection for the Buddha. The Buddha taught us that path, so therefore we're grateful, right? We have affection and gratitude toward the Buddha because he's the one who taught us the path that we have confidence in the effectiveness of, right? So those things all go together. Um, this word, Shraddha, Sada, it's listed at, if you don't know this, Buddhist love lists. So this word is in a number of lists. It's listed first in the 10 wholesome factors uh, that lead to enlightenment. It's uh, given as a foundation for and a prerequisite for achieving spiritual attainment in the Buddhist tradition. Uh, it's listed as the first in the five spiritual attainments. The first thing we, may, we attain is faith, confidence, confidence in the Buddhist path, confidence in the, Buddhist, the Buddha as a, as a role model. So that confidence resulting from faith helps the practitioner to, to maintain their commitment to their practice and their diligence, right? Their diligence, their motivation to do their practice, to, to get on the cushion every day and meditate and chant and do the various things that we do as practice. So if Paul's letter to the Hebrews is the most often cited source about what faith means and how it's understood in Christianity, what's the Buddhist scripture that's kind of the parallel? What's, what's the thing that's comparable? Uh, I suspect, probably, it's uh, a text called the, the uh, Kalama Sutta. Um, the Buddha's Discourse to the Kalamas. It's part of the uh, Anguttara Nikaya of the Pali Canon, the, the kind of really old scriptures in the Buddhist tradition. It's a, it's a pretty long text. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of summarize the story, and I'm going to just quote the, the, the most central passage, right? The part of it that's most relevant to the idea of faith. So the Kalamas in the scripture are presented as, described as a people, which is a little bit vague. So presumably they're a tribe or a, a community of people. Uh, the Buddha and a group of monks visited one of the villages that the Kalamas live in. Uh, the people of that village went to the Buddha for advice because they were spiritually confused. And the reason they were so confused was because teachers kept coming, spiritual teachers coming, people claiming to have spiritual attainment and have know the truth and they're teaching it, kept coming to the village and saying, here's the truth, here's what you should believe and what you should do and contradicting each other. And then kind of talking smack about each other. Oh, no, don't believe that person. Believe, that, believe me and not that person. So there's a, the, the Kalamas are now like, who's right? 
right? Who, who should we believe? Who should we follow? Who's telling us the truth? They can't figure out how to determine what's true or what teachers they should have confidence in than the ones that they shouldn't, right? So the Buddha tells them, so here's the passage from the scripture. Don't go by reports, by legends, by traditions, by scripture, by logical conjecture, by inference, by analogies, by agreement through pondering views, by probability or by the thought, this contemplative is our teacher. When you know for yourselves that these qualities are unskillful, these qualities are blameworthy, these qualities are criticized by the wise, these qualities when adopted and carried out lead to harm and to suffering, then you should abandon them. When you know for yourselves that these qualities are skillful, these qualities are blameless, these qualities are praised by the wise, these qualities when adopted and carried out lead to welfare and to happiness, then you should enter and remain in them. Now, that passage is so important that word for word, it appears four different times in the scripture. The Buddha says it, and then he says it again, and he says it again, and he says it again. It's important. He said it four times. Now, how should we understand that? Right? How should we understand this teaching? What does this have to do with faith? How is it compared to the way Paul explained faith to the, that letter to the Hebrews? The first thing to say about this passage from the, the Kalama Sutta is um, Buddhists disagree about it. Not a shock. Buddhists disagree about it. Different teachers have different interpretations of it. Um, how far they're willing to go, right? How far they go in interpreting what it actually means. For example, I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations here. The strongest kind of statement sort of about the importance of this text, there's a Theravadan teacher, Somatera wrote that the sutra is justly famous for its encouragement of free inquiry. The spirit of the sutta signifies a teaching that is exempt from fanaticism, bigotry, dogmatism, and intolerance. Now, a little bit milder position, another teacher, Tanasaro Bhikkhu, this is what he wrote about it. Um, Although this discourse is often cited as the Buddha's carte blanche for following one's own sense of right and wrong, it actually says something much more rigorous than that. Traditions are not to be followed simply because they are traditions. Reports, such as historical accounts or news, are not to be followed simply because the source seems reliable. One's own preferences, this is an important bit, One's own preferences are not to be followed simply because they seem logical or resonate with one's feelings. Instead, any view or belief, even our own, must be tested by the results it yields when put into practice. And to guard against the possibility of any bias or limitations in one's understanding of these results, they must be further checked against the experience of people who are wise. The ability to question and test one's own belief in an appropriate way is called appropriate attention. The ability to recognize and choose wise people as mentors is called having admirable friends. Now, I'm going to give you one more of these. This is the most cautious one. This is the most sort of, don't try to take this further than it's really meant to go. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, very well-respected uh, American uh, Theravadan Buddhist scholar. This is what he said about it. The discourse has been described as the Buddha's charter of free inquiry. And though the discourse certainly does counter the decrees of dogmatism and blind faith with a vigorous call for free investigation, it is problematic whether the sutta can support all the positions that have been ascribed to it. On the basis of a single passage quoted out of context, the Buddha has been made out to be a pragmatic empiricist who dismisses all doctrine and faith and whose Dhamma is simply a free thinker's kit to truth which invites each one to accept and reject whatever he likes. But don't do that. So the one thing that all of them do agree on, though, is no blind faith, right? Not even in the Buddha himself. 
right? Remember, the sutras in that list of things that are a bad reason to believe something, one of the things in that list is because this contemplative is our teacher, right? In other words, as I read it anyway, what the Buddha is saying here is, don't just take my word for it, right? Put these ideas to the test. Don't believe them and accept them just because a guy in a robe said so, right? By comparison, Paul's way of formulating faith is kind of exactly the opposite idea, right? Trust the teachings because of who the teacher is, and that's the only really good reason that matters at all, right? Believe the things because of what the source of them is, as opposed to testing them for yourself. Down at Belmont Zen Center uh, in, in June, we had, a, we had a movie afternoon. We, about once a month, we try to do something that's mostly just kind of social, you know, build the sangha, build the community. Um, and uh, in June, we watched a documentary um, called uh, Fearless Mountain. It's a documentary about uh, a place called Abayagiri. It's a Theravada monastery that's in California. Uh, and near the end of it, um, Ajahn Amaro, who's the co-abbot of the, the monastery, explains part of what attracted him personally to the Buddhist path, the Buddha Dharma in the first place. And this is what he said. He said, if it works, use it. If it doesn't work, fine, dump it. It's up to you as an individual. You are the final arbiter of truth as an individual. You decide, you see for yourself. Does it work? Is it useful? Does it make my life, life better? If it does, fine. If, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. If it doesn't, fine, leave it. If it does, great, use it. It's freely available. So if you think in these terms about faith, from kind of the Buddhist understanding of the word faith, the closest thing that it reminds me of is for, really, for many, many years, I can't see her anymore, I'm very upset about it, but for many, many years my primary medical practitioner was a uh, care, medical care provider was a nurse practitioner. Uh, I, I trusted her. I had confidence in her. Uh, her medical advice was beneficial. Her past treatment decisions had been effective. Therefore, I had faith that her advice about things in the future would be just as effective. Right? Uh, the Buddha is sometimes referred to as the great physician with the, treating the fundamental human disease, which is dukkha, suffering, right, dissatisfaction. So we can think about the teachings of the Buddha in a, in a, in a medical sort of way like that, in a comparable way. Now, in a similar way, I want, I want to go back to Bhikkhu Bodhi for just a minute. I want to read one more little bit from the essay that he wrote, that I read from a second ago. What can be justly maintained is that those aspects of the Buddha's teaching that come within the purview of our ordinary experience can be personally confirmed within experience, and that this confirmation provides a sound basis for placing faith in those aspects of the teaching that necessarily transcend ordinary experience. Faith in the Buddha's teaching is never regarded as an end in and of itself, nor as a sufficient guarantee of liberation, but only as the starting point for an evolving process of inner transformation that comes to fulfillment in personal insight. So in other words, to put that a little more simply, some aspects of the Buddha Dharma can be tested through our own experiences and some can't. So by testing the things that can be tested, we develop a confidence in the Buddha's teachings about things that can't be tested. Or to kind of put it in similar ways to the way Paul wrote, in the Dharma, the experience of things gained gives us assurance of things hoped for. And the observation of things seen gives us con the conviction of things not seen. So I hope that thinking about this a little bit, and thinking about it in the context of your own spiritual development will be beneficial to your own faith, your faith in the Buddha, your faith in the teachings, your faith in the community, and maybe more importantly, your faith in yourself. 
Sangbal Hashipshio, may you, I, and all beings manifest enlightenment.